like to say a few words from Professor Prahant Kamat just before we start and prove the floor for him. First thing, he is uh, from the University of Notre Dame, United States, because he just put here. And then he's a member of the International Device Board in Sydney. I mean, he has played a very important role for us, okay, with several device evaluations. And I would like to thank you for uh, his the work that has been done. Okay, I want to mention two facts important now. He is the editor in chief of the ACS and his letters. For those one that don't know, ACS and his letter has impact factor above 20. If you, most of you want to be there, you have to cross uh, the barrier by Professor Kamat. This figure of figure to say. And uh, there's a opportunity for you to learn from him today how to do that. Second point, for those one that don't know too much about him, his eight index, which is important as a parameter to use today, is above 100 in the Google Scholar. These two facts tell a lot, okay? Professor Kamat, I'm very helpful to have you here with us. Okay, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Okay, you, your time is fully. We're going to delay a bit, don't worry with that. Okay, thanks. Now the floor is going to you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, all of you uh, at SIGN for giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, again, I discussed with Anna and uh, we came out with a little more broader topic uh, just to tell you, uh, we all hear about uh, perovskites and quantum dots. I'm just giving you a sh short run. Uh, it is a broad view uh, of what has happened and what is happening and where you can contribute uh, into some of these ideas. So this one. And uh, there was, uh, I really enjoyed the morning talks. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, share one of the uh, things uh, uh, is uh, uh, the previous talk uh, Fabio mentioned about the fossil fuels and its importance. Uh, in fact, 50 years back, we thought fossil fuels were the answer. And we never thought about uh, what is there on the other side of this mountain. Although this nice water is coming and the fossil fuels are plenty, we didn't bother to see what is there on the other side. And in fact, to prove that, this is an editorial in Nature in 1971, exactly about 50 years back. This is a, a, a report from an MIT press uh, based on a fossil fuel study. And uh, some of the statements, you can note down this reference and read it later, uh, but uh, what he's saying is uh, in an entirely natural world, no doubt one consequence of adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by the exhaust from fossil fuel chimneys would be to increase the growth of plant life. It again goes on to say, among other things, this careful study shows that the greenhouse effect, as it is called, has been a greatly exaggerated topic for anxiety. And you can see here how we missed the point. At that time, if we had thought about these carbon footprints and these greenhouse gas effects, we would have been in a much better shape today because of these kind of studies and reports that pushed us back. And uh, today we know that various energy sources, we need energy. The population is increasing. The energy demand is increasing. Uh, so what we now do is trying to understand the carbon life cycle, right? So we consider different energies. This is a nature energy that is a detailed analysis. Uh, you want to take about the carbon footprint of each technology. And uh, sometimes nuclear is being said as it's a really green, there is no carbon footprint. In fact, it has carbon footprint. You think about the uh, taking out the ore, processing and enriching. A lot of energy goes inside other than building steel and cement. So what they say is uh, for uh, coal fired, 11% of the energy of the coal power station is offset by energy needed to build the plant and supply the fuel. It takes away what they call embodied energy that's requirement for construction, operation, upstream, CH4 emissions. So you can look in this chart and see how it is. Nuclear power is twice as good as coal with the embedded energy of 5%. Wind and solar still are lower. If you have a, a PV uh, thing, it takes about three years to offset the carbon footprint. 
And right now the PV industry is consuming more energy than it is producing in the world. So uh, we have to take into consideration all these facts before uh, we try to do these things. But one of the good news, uh, just to show you that in the US, this is a July 28, 21, and from the uh, EIA, this is the uh, Energy Information Administration of the US government. They said that renewable became the second most prevalent US electricity source after natural gas. And uh, so both natural gas and new, uh, renewables are going up, uh, nuclear is remaining steady, and uh, coal is on the decline. So uh, again, uh, with that one, I want to show, tell you that uh, there were three major game-changing developments, which in fact, fossil fuel industries missed it. Uh, they always thought that these kind of things will survive only with subsidies. But these renewables have shown that they can, with the private investments, uh, even the previous uh, speaker mentioned that in some places, wind and solar is cheaper. Uh, to install uh, new energies. Uh, this is a surge in solar and wind as cheaper and cleaner alternative. Uh, another one is storage batteries, and more importantly, LEDs and display devices. Uh, today, uh, you go to any part of the world, you'll see the LED lightings uh, running everywhere, and that is bringing down the energy consumption. And you have to take into account that energy saved is energy gained. Uh, so this is uh, another major thing that has happened uh, in the things. Uh, again, the solar prices, uh, this is uh, uh, Moore's law of photovoltaics. Every time the world solar power doubles, the cost of panel falls by 26%. So that is the line they are shown. And in fact, now you can get anywhere from 20 to, uh, cents to three, 30 cents the, per kilowatt. Uh, this is the EU spot market. Uh, this one. So this is the, what it is. Today, if you want to put a solar panel, it is not the panel cost that is a major factor. It is the other infrastructure, labor, and those things uh, that has not come down significantly. Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to switch the gear now. Uh, that is just a big background for those of you uh, given uh, this uh, carbon footprint. So I'm going to switch back and say, uh, I'll talk about semiconductor nanostructures, uh, which we are using in this uh, next generation photovoltaics, how they came into play. And uh, this was again in 1973, there was a oil crisis, uh, OPEC oil embargo. Remember the previous one was 1971, the Nature Editorial. This is 1973, there was an oil embargo. And uh, at that time, people started thinking, can we rely on fossil fuel? And artificial photosynthesis was coined to mimic photosynthesis at that time. Uh, the photo-induced electron transfer reactions came into play. Semiconductor photoelectrochemistry became a very popular research topic. If you go in 1970s papers, you will see the semiconductor electrode pupil putting in this uh, electrochemical cell, shining light, characterizing uh, this thing. It also emerged uh, photocatalytic properties of semiconductor particle systems. I strongly advise the new generation of researchers to go back, read some of the papers written by these authors in 1970s. They are very inspirational, more visionary, and you will always get some new ideas to do your research. Very fundamental studies they laid down at that time. Uh, in 90s, what we saw was another transformative uh, of these semiconductor nanostructures in light uh, energy conversion. Uh, one was environmental remediation. It was a photocatalysis of uh, 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 water and air purification became a very popular topic. Uh, people started studying. And uh, then also at the time, people were looking into the solar fuels, trying to make uh, hydrogen uh, at the time from water uh, photoelectrolysis at the time. Another one came out was disensitized solar cell in 1991, that uh, famous paper. People used to use the disensitized uh, uh, studies to generate photocurrent as early as 1970s. But this one was a mesoscopic structure of TiO2 made the large surface area and provided a basis for disensitized solar cell and people studied extensively for another 10, 20 years. 
Another turning point came in 1993 uh, when uh, MIT group, uh, Munji Bhavendis group, they published a paper to make these size selective uh, semiconductor uh, quantum dots. And we, today we refer to the hot injection method. This was a very transformative uh, in terms of both uh, trying to make semiconductors with a precise uh, dimension and tunable properties. And uh, until then, people used to make semiconductor colloids, we call it, uh, but they were not of uh, size selectivity. There is a wide distribution. Uh, no physicists or electrical engineers were interested talking to chemists to make uh, semiconductor particles. But this paper opened up the eyes because in other way to making this quantum uh, size uh, uh, structures was to have MBE type setup and you can make one thin film in an entire day. But here you can make in kilogram quantities in a couple of hours and whatever size. So this transformed the understanding of entire thing and uh, both physicists, electrical engineers, other disciplines appreciated the chemistry aspects of it. And again, this is according to me, a big transformative point uh, in terms of nanotechnology. Uh, we studied a variety of uh, semiconductor nanostructures. Our specialty was to create these hybrid assemblies to bring in two components. One say semiconductor metal or a semiconductor and a molecular sensitizer. So just to give an example, for example, if you have a square in dye with a carboxylic acid you can link it to TiO2, and if you have a thiol group, you can have a cadmium selenide, and you can uh, uh, energy transfer to this dye, and this can inject uh, into TiO2. So these kind of a variety of processes we have studied over the years, and uh, basically to understand the light-induced processes, interfacial charge transfer processes, and how this can be implemented in the light energy conversion devices. Uh, quantum dot solar cell. So from that, we uh, moved on to the quantum dot solar cell for about uh, uh, 10 years or so uh, until about the perovskite came in. This was one of the hot field uh, in the early millennium, like uh, between 2000 to 2012 uh, period. So this was one of our first studies where we showed that uh, you can deposit this size quantized semiconductors on electrode surfaces and they show this same kind of a photo response. And uh, again, this uh, higher uh, efficiency you see with the smaller size comes from this larger band gap. We continued the study and got about, believe me, at that time it was a big excitement to get a 5% solar cell uh, in 2012, okay? Uh, but uh, people pushed it up to maybe now uh, eight, 9%. Uh, but this is how uh, we made this uh, sandwich cells. Uh, there is another class of uh, semiconductors that are emerging. These are uh, moves away from the heavy metals, uh, but they are equally interesting. These are 136 chalcopyrite structure uh, and uh, it's like a silver indium selenide, copper indium selenide, those kind of uh, structures. And again, they give you a wide range of uh, band gap to do this. And interestingly, they also show uh, size quantization effects. And they also have been used in solar cells and LEDs and found useful. And the research, uh, you still see some good papers coming out in these areas. Okay, as I mentioned, after 2012, uh, the perovskites came in and they changed the whole game of uh, these uh, semiconductor nanostructures. So what we started with disensitized solar cell in 90s, then became solid state uh, uh, disensitized solar cell. Uh, extremely thin absorber. These are like quantum dot uh, uh, solar cells and then the perovskite solar cells. Uh, two things to take into account. In the beginning, we have to use an electrolyte as a uh, whole transport layer uh, to recycle these ones. In the, then the solid state people use a spiro omitat and showed that solid state DSSs can be constructed. So the, all this understanding help to advanced these perovskite solar cells. Now, what used to be about 10 micron thick solar cell became less than a micron thick. So you can see here less amount of material, more absorbance of the light and more efficiency. So all these things went into these perovskite solar cells. Now you can get a record PCE of about 25% uh, 
uh, people claim it. Again, for those of you, uh, just quickly uh, to tell you that this is the ABX3 crystal. And uh, the interesting part is this octahedral of uh, lead uh, halide uh, structure. There is a cavity in which a, a site cation gets in. Uh, in this case, only three cations uh, can uh, be uh, in, uh, inserted. Uh, that is uh, methyl ammonium, formamidium, and cesium. Others are either too small or too large and uh, to happen this one. Again, uh, for, uh, to show you the solar cell structure, this was done uh, earlier. Uh, we made lots of cells and uh, this is your FTO on which you put compact TiO2 and then mesoscopic TiO2 and methyl ammonium, lead iodide film, whole conductor and the top contact. And uh, then you characterize your cells and uh, we got about 17%, I think we went up to 18, 19%, and then we claimed victory and moved on because the, everyone was so competitive, we couldn't stand in competition in making it. So what we moved was uh, then the perovskite quantum dots came in. These are like uh, mostly cesium uh, lead uh, halide type uh, uh, semiconductor nanostructures. And as you can see, by changing the halides, chloride, bromide, iodide, you can change that emission, which means that band gap, uh, you can uh, tune it. And not only that, by mixing these two uh, uh, halides, you can control the band gap between those two and this one. This is another one. If you dope with manganese, you can further downshift uh, this uh, 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 emission, uh, this one. So uh, we make the synthesis, we spin coat it, and uh, we can uh, put it between these two glass slides. And now it is ready for doing emission studies or transient absorption studies. And again, when you start with these colloids and anneal it, they grow in size uh, from 11 nanometers to the 112. And we have followed this growth process and other things, uh, but this is what we use and we could make solar cells. Again, the efficiency is not something to uh, brag about. It is always only 5%, but we showed that uh, it is important to fill in these wide spaces by using multiple layers of low concentrations. Uh, but uh, people have now reported up to about 13% uh, efficiency for uh, these kind of uh, uh, solar cells. And I think it is still around 13, 14%. One of the things is, uh, when you make these colloids, there is a lot of ligands associated with it. Unless you remove these ligands by washing or annealing, uh, you cannot make uh, good contacts. And that is one of the things that is driving. And again, as I said, if the particle grows from 11 nanometers to 100 nanometers by annealing, uh, it, we cannot still call it quantum dot. It becomes like a bulk film. But in this case, they use was washing uh, process to take away the ligands and make it. Uh, this is still going. Uh, as I mentioned in earlier discussion that uh, one of the things is it's very difficult to compete with the existing technology, which is silicon, but there is a room to make it uh, uh, what we call as a tandem solar cell. This is a four junction solar cell where you take a perovskite solar cell, both transparent, and then slam it on a silicon solar cell and then connect in series, and then you can get uh, both uh, high energy and low energy very efficiently. The other one is a two uh, uh, junction where you grow this perovskite film on a silicon and uh, then so that the high energy is absorbed first by perovskite and then the rest is absorbed by silicon. So you can make these things happen. Okay, so with that, now uh, there is another uh, area is opened up in the perovskite. These are low dimensional organometal halide perovskites. From 3D, as I mentioned in the A side cation, you can play around uh, with the A side cation. If you have, instead of methyl ammonium, you started a bulky uh, ammonium ions like butyl uh, ammonium or uh, phenethyl ammonium. Uh, in this case, you can break this 3D structure, basically slice it out. And depending upon the ratio of methyl ammonium and say phenethyl amine, uh, ammonium, uh, ions, you can control the layer thickness. That means how many layers of this. So if you have a 100% this PEA, you get 2D structure, it's n equal to one because there is no methyl ammonium. So there is no 3D structure. 
So that is n equal to one, which shows nice exiting, uh, uh, this one, exciton absorption here. Uh, that is shown here, uh, the blue color. And then when you try to change the ratio of this methyl ammonium to PA, PEA, uh, you can tune n equal to two, then six, 10. So beyond six, these films behave like a bulk material. They are not quantized structure. You can see the colors, you can study the properties. Uh, there is a lot of thing going on. Uh, in fact, uh, now these 2D structures, because of that organic uh, bulky uh, cation, they are more moisture resistant. So people have been trying to use these 3D, 2D structures uh, to uh, develop uh, and more stable cells. So this is a one paper that just I'm uh, pointing out that uh, people have gotten now the solar cells with quite high efficiency uh, with this one. Okay, uh, so uh, that is just a brief uh, summary of the perovskites and perovskite quantum dots. And now I will show you other uh, applications of these uh, things like LEDs and upconversion and other applications because these are also very important. Uh, the one of the first thing is uh, LEDs. Uh, so this is a sort of a review article, uh, perspective article, uh, and that summarizes some of the perovskite quantum dots uh, in uh, uh, LED devices. So again, LEDs is a reverse of a, a solar cell. So instead of uh, shining light to generate electricity, here you pass the electricity and inject both electrons and holes and uh, accumulate them at the, uh, this uh, active layer and that will emit light. So if everything goes good, your electrons comes here, the holes comes here, and then these start emitting because of this recombination. But the charge transport across these layers is very important. Uh, the rate with which these are injected. So that's what this talks about is efficiency roll off. If one of them is less efficient and uh, you can see uh, that uh, the efficiency rolls off. Uh, this also shows you the band gap of different materials that can be used in these LED devices, and you can also tune uh, these different uh, devices uh, in this uh, thing. Uh, we have studied uh, uh, copper indium uh, 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 zinc uh, 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 selenide uh, uh, materials for the, the LEDs. And one of the things, again, uh, mentioned earlier is we wanted to see how one can control uh, these electron and hole uh, transport across these layers. So again, the zinc oxide is electron transport layer and uh, polyvinyl carbazole or uh, this uh, trifin uh, uh, diamine, uh, this one is a uh, TPD as a hole transport layer. Uh, there are two different ones. So just to show you the band energy. So basically holes are injected into the CIZS and electrons are injected here. And what we did was we varied the thickness of zinc oxide to see how the efficiency changes. Again, these are the LED response at different voltages of the cells of this two different uh, hole transport layer. But what is interesting in this slide here is the zinc oxide thickness. As you can see here, there is an optimal thickness at which uh, the uh, electrons and holes come together very thin. So as you increase the thickness, uh, the, it takes much longer time for electrons to come in. As a result, you drop in your efficiency uh, in these cells, uh, again, uh, making this one. Uh, uh, another one we are, uh, this is our current interest we are working is uh, uh, semi quantum dots for energy up conversion and also uh, transfer. So this is another area where you can combine a dye uh, or a molecular sensitizer uh, to the uh, perovskite nanocrystal and uh, study. In this case, what happens is uh, if you, uh, in this case, it's a methyl ammonium, formamidium, lead iodide, uh, it cannot transfer energy to the singlet. Instead, it transfers energy to a triplet and generates a rubarine triplet. And the two triplets combine to give you a singlet excited uh, rubarine. So that's why you see Although you are exciting at 785 nanometers, you can get emission back at 610 nanometers uh, from this process. Uh, another interesting fact about is allowing these halides. So if you can mix this, uh, this is cesium red bromide, typically green fluorescent, this is chloride, this is blue and iodide red, but you can mix these halides, bromide iodide or iodide, uh, sorry, chloride uh, bromide and you can tune the entire region 
and uh, you can change the band gap. So uh, what we are just now uh, looking into is uh, this rhodamine dye, uh, it can interact with the cesium lead bromide. So uh, in this case, what you can see here, you increase the rhodamine dye and the emission of cesium lead bromide quenches and the emission, again, it is not as high because of the quantum yield of emission, but if you magnify this one here, you can see here the emission of rhodamine B goes up, okay? And this is an excited 400 nanometer where rhodamine B does not absorb. We can also the, do the reverse way. We can keep the rhodamine B concentration constant and increase the cesium lead bromide so that more light is absorbed by cesium lead bromide. In that case also, we see this enhancement in the rhodamine B emission. So note that here rhodamine B is very constant and we can calculate the enhancement and about a factor of seven enhancement we see. And as you increase more, there is again uh, internal absorption of this uh, thing and we start seeing a decrease adding to this one. We also probed uh, how fast is energy transfer occurring by doing a transient absorption measurements. And you can see here, this is the bleach, the excitonic bleach of cesium lead bromide. And as this one decreases, we see an increase a bleach of rhodamine B. And that is because you are forming the singlet excited state. So we can follow the decay recovery of this uh, cesium lead bromide. And when you put, it becomes faster. Note that fast component here. On the other hand, if you look into the bleach of rhodamine B, what we see is uh, if you don't have cesium lead bromide, you see the singlet excited says little bit trace and it's flat. But if you add to that one cesium lead bromide, now you see a small growth that forms. And you can see the kinetics of this one, the growth and the fast decay here. We can get the kinetics and we know now that it, energy transfer can occur as fast as 200 picoseconds. So with that, uh, again, there are a lot of new opportunities are popping out. It is not just the solar cells. Uh, that you can count on. Uh, there is also now the high energy detectors. People are making scintillators. So that is another area that's going. Uh, we also studied extensively this halide ion migration in the perovskite, which I didn't talk about today. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the message I want to convey is the quantum dot architectures uh, for light energy conversion are still in play. Uh, the advantage is you can do chemistry, change the surface, change the properties of these materials and tune it to whatever you want. And the ternary and quaternary semiconductor queries offer new opportunities uh, in designing next generation solar cells. And again, uh, these halide perovskites uh, are the new uh, game play. So that's the current our research group. We don't have a large group, but uh, these are excellent workers. Uh, these some of them have graduated. Uh, we do have some active collaborations, uh, visiting students and uh, those uh, people. Thank you very much. Thanks for the wonderful talk. And very inspired to concern this quantum dots. This is now we open the talk for questions. I believe that there are several now. Yeah, Anna Flavia is already with her hand up. Okay, as always, Anna Flavia. For the first question, we have the... Thank you, Prashant. Always a very inspiring talking. Um, so um, in the beginning of our talk, you said the light emitting um, diodes as like uh, one of the game changer for these moments that we're living now, these moments of energy um, transition. But concerning, let's think about this quantum dots uh, for solar cells application. I think since the paper from Luther, from NRL, we didn't see much growth in terms of efficiency. I think it's the plateau is still like 14%. I work with these quantum dots in the past. And one thing that I think is really a, a challenge here is like, so you have that those ligands around the quantum dots and when you need to remove them. But then when you remove them, um, and also some of these ligands are still there. And also they create like very deep traps. So this is, do you think this is the most important challenge or there are others? So it's possible to go further in terms of efficiency to see like one day like a, a quantum dot solar cells with efficiency like higher than 20% or 
or should we work on light, low light intensity, think about, okay, let's use those quantum dot solar cells for internet of things or other applications. You know, like, uh, I don't think these quantum dots will be uh, uh, used for solar cells because uh, it's a two-step process rather than one step uh, where they can make real to real, right? So here you have to make it separately and then uh, apply it. Uh, whereas the current, uh, the perovskite solar cell is they can spray it uh, uh, or paint it or uh, print it and then annihilate it and the film comes right away. So it is much easier for commercial application and giving you higher efficiency. Uh, but what uh, is, I think the quantum dots might play a role in like LED type devices or scintillators, you know, high energy detection and those kind of things. Uh, here is the, that's what these guys did was they took this uh, cesium lead iodide and uh, oh, I'm not sharing the screen. Uh, did you, I'm sharing the screen or no? No. Okay, so I just uh, show you uh, quickly this one is that they coated a, a inorganic uh, uh, capping layer uh, here, thin layer, and uh, they protected that cesium lead bromide. And so that way they can inject uh, uh, holes inside uh, into this one. So uh, holes and electrons. Uh, so that may be one strategy is to have an inorganic shell and it has not been very successful. There have been reports of uh, cadmium sulfide, sorry, uh, zinc sulfide or SiO2, but it's extremely hard. So if we can cap them with some inorganic shell uh, mm -hmm. coordination, uh, that is a hope uh, that it can be used for some application. Otherwise, even in photocatalysis, they cannot be used. All the studies are in the organic solvents. So uh, we were trying to uh, recently cap with cadmium sulfide. And what we can do is a very thin layer of cadmium sulfide uh, that lets you increase the polarity a little bit, but not a whole lot. Thank you. Thanks. So we have a next question now for Professor Rubens Marcial Filho. Can you just... Um, Russian, thanks very much for a very, very nice talking. Very inspiring. Uh, Let's put my question to see your opinion. Uh, with this tremendous amount of energy that the sunlight uh, delivers for us, one kilowatt per square meter, um, what about the stability of these new materials for long time operation? That's the first point that I would like to mention. And to, to learn from your expertise, what kind of material do you believe that could be uh, next generation to be able to accommodate such a very high uh, energy delivery that can use in a better way. Yeah, you know, like uh, uh, the first of all, stability. Uh, stability has always been an issue for the perovskite solar cells. Uh, the, there are two aspects. One is extrinsic and one is intrinsic. The extrinsic is like a heat, light, humidity. Uh, and that can be taken care of uh, by uh, sealing properly or protecting from heat, light, that is not a problem. The problem is intrinsic. Uh, one of the things we found out was uh, the mobility of uh, halide ions, in particular iodide. Uh, when you, the iodide even comes out of the film, if you're long-term operation. So how to suppress those kind of mobility? So we need to understand that one uh, to do it uh, before. But people have been doing a lot of treatment, surface modifications to keep it uh, under thing. But uh, most of the stability tests people do is in the lab, not outdoor. I think we need more outdoor data to confirm that uh, it is stable and it can be used. Uh, that is one part. The second part you mentioned is uh, uh, how can we use in application? One of the best example is uh, indium phosphide quantum dots. Uh, when people are making cadmium sel uh, sulfur selenide, everyone said, uh, well, uh, you cannot use cadmium. Uh, it's, it's bad for the environment. But uh, for example, in Europe, people couldn't get funding to work on cadmium selenide. As a result, most of the research came from the US and some part in Asia and maybe in the South America. Uh, but the thing that happened is indium phosphide took over and today 
every TV that comes in, they call it as a Q techno QD technology or QD TV, where you have a back uh, uh, display to enhance the colors. That tells you that these kind of uh, materials can be used in a practical uh, uh, setting and use it all night. You know, if you see these glowing screens uh, running 24 hours a day, uh, at least they last four or five years for sure. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is uh, this may not be helpful for solar cells, but some other things will come out and uh, it may be making transformative. And regarding new materials, again, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, what new things can come up? Uh, there is still, uh, if you want to do good science, there is, uh, this has opened up like 2D materials with different uh, uh, cations. Uh, you can use sensitizers as a cation. That is one of the areas uh, that I see might grow in future. Uh, but other than that, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, so uh, another one is this uh, uh, castorite or chalcopyrite. People are trying to do it. Uh, Again, okay. the stability issue is a major thing. Yeah. Thanks very much for your comments, for answering. Thank you, and your for presence, of course. I'm always an optimistic person, so I, yeah, things takes care of. You know, like uh, if you see, just uh, you have to look back uh, what uh, happened in. That's why I said 50 years back, we never thought that uh, doing it. Uh, I used to be working since uh, my graduate PhD studies in the renewable energy. For about 30, 20 to 30 years, I have taken a lot of laughs and criticism whenever I said, okay, solar energy is going to make a change, right? People laughed on face of you. Yeah, you know, dream on, you know, kind of a thing. It will never happen. Now, who is going to buy this and all kinds of stuff. Uh, even uh, in our own university, we wanted to put solar panels uh, about uh, 20 years, uh, 10 years back. And they say it is not cost effective. And 10 years later today, they are putting the same solar panels. So yeah. uh, the people, things will change. For sure, for sure. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks for the question. I just want to uh, ask one question. At some point in the, your talk, you mentioned that, oh, the, the perovskite increased increase the efficiency, the competition was so high, then we moved to the quantum dots, okay? Do you think that the competition or today to improve the efficiency of perovskite to say it's very tough to improve the perovskite the efficiency because we reach a limit in which maybe we need a new breakthrough or if you don't have a breakthrough base we stabilize it at about 25 yeah. percent the the, re, the the comment i made was uh, we work with smaller group of people okay uh we don't have an army of uh, 40 50 people uh, who can test every possible combinations so when you were up to like 18, 20%, there were only a few groups and it was a challenge to increase and study. Uh, in fact, a lot of people came to our lab at the time to uh, learn. And in fact, before that, I have sent a student to Korea in Amgyu Park's lab to learn how to make these good cells. And he came back and he taught us and we were able to make it. But what happened was it took to the next level and the efficiency going up, right? So what happens is, Yes, I can make solar cells up 20%, but from an efficiency point of view, I will not be able to say I made a cell, okay? I just joined, I'm, I, I will be a follower of somebody else. But on the other hand, I'm good, and also our funding is for fundamental science. So, and this is what we are good. So why not we do something what we are good at and do these things? So that is the reason why we, uh, switched over from uh, solar cell uh, characterization to the fundamental things. Uh, in the beginning, we were trying to correlate properties and solar cell performance and other things, which helped us a lot understanding. So don't get me wrong that it is good to make the solar cells if you are studying even fundamentals. Uh, that gives you an insight what goes on in the cell and how it gets better. But see, like today, I cannot publish a paper saying that uh, I made a 20% solar cell. But I can publish a paper saying I am understanding some new science in this one. And one of the suggestion for all these younger guys is don't highlight in the abstract and other places that you made 18% sell uh, to 20%. So still it is less than 25%, right? 
focus on the science. And you mentioned in the ACS energy letters, I'm going to give an offer to anybody is, if you want to before submitting, if you can send it to me, I can give you feedback what it takes to make a uh, impactful paper. A lot of the time, people put too much data, they dilute their data, and the readers cannot find what is the key finding from the study. So all the supporting data you can put in supporting information, but highlight the key finding. Put minimum amount of figures. If you put two panels or one panel, that figure really stands out. When you have like 20 panels in one figure, you cannot understand what that figure is. So uh, again, uh, for anybody who want to publish ACS Energy Letters, we welcome uh, your contribution and I'll be very happy to give you feedback so that uh, we can send out for a review and get the feedback. Because there are sometimes it's very small uh, things that you need to change or take out sentences for which you don't have any support. Okay, I'm very well help to listen to comment on that. Uh, because as always, as you say, we should make the best of our resources, human and also the great resources that provide for us to get the best achievement in science. And sometimes we have to know where, what is the time now to shift a bit where can contribute most in science, fundamental science, but based what you are doing. I fully agree with you. Okay. And with this, yes, letter, thanks for the remarks. I think you'll be very to say useful for all the all city members and those beyond of that too. Okay, I mean, based with that, I think there's no additional questions. And then, okay, I think there's an additional question here in the question and answers. I just do one here. Uh, uh, there's Andres Pardo. He just mentioned the excellent talk of Jukamat. A great pleasure listening to you. When doing PSC, you use solvents like DMF. Here's on the question and answers, Kamat. And the DMSO, out for large scale induced applications. Those solvents are not the best choice. Is there another alternative, a green solvent that could be used? Yeah, again, uh, these are uh, different to say when you are using lead compounds and calling it green, it sort of uh, breaks. Uh, it's like a, um, uh, do you worry? You know, like, uh, the one thing is uh, people, uh, all the solvents are industrial process. What is industry has done is uh, trying to minimize the waste. Uh, if you can minimize the waste, I think it should be okay. The green solvents are great if you can come up with it. Uh, a lot of people are trying to say ionic liquid. The problem with ionic liquid is you cannot make in large quantities and uh, keep it away from the moisture. Uh, so again, uh, uh, there is a lot of people uh, advocate uh, earth abundant metals and uh, green solvents and everything. But underlying point is uh, we have not run out of any of the elements. And uh, uh, again, sometimes what you need is very little amount, not a whole lot amount, uh, and you can conserve it. So uh, again, I, I'm not the best person to answer uh, the environmental thing. So. Again, there are two aspects. One, you can take totally environmental issue and work on it, or you can go with the fundamental science and forget about the other aspects. Thanks for the comment, Kamal. I think use is use, use, useful. Okay, uh, thanks. Okay, I'd like to thank you very much for the nice, very great talk. And then it was very insightful. And then a pleasure for everyone here. Mm -hmm.